Hello, and welcome to this LRB podcast, part of a regular series in which we consider the work of a major poet of the 20th century, in this case, the long 20th century, through a lens of the pieces written about her or him in the LRB archive. My name is Seamus Perry, and I teach English literature at the University of Oxford, and I'm talking to Mark Ford, who is a professor of English at University College London, and also a poet. The author we're talking about today is A.E. Hausman, uh, author of A Shropshire Lad, one of the best-selling volumes of English poetry in the 20th century, and a classic example of what Philip Larkin would call um, a fouled-up guy. But, Mark, can we begin by um, saying something about his background? He's born in 1859, isn't he? Yes, born in the middle of the Victorian period, and Shropshire Lad is published in 1896, so it is the long 20th century, as you say, uh, but it didn't really become extremely popular until the uh, 20th century. But Hausman's came from a fairly prosperous uh, background. His dad was a solicitor, though he then became an alcoholic. Uh, not such a good career move. <laughs> um, and uh, he was the oldest of seven children, and it sounds like a fairly idyllic family um, in which to grow up um, until the age of 12 when his mother died. And that was the first first evidence we see of Hausman beginning to lose his faith. It was a kind of almost a rite of passage for Victorian intellectuals, although those growing up. At some point, they started exploring whether or not the, the extent to which they believed in God. And Hausman didn't declare himself an atheist till he was 21, but he his faith was severely weakened by his mother's death when he was 12. But the family was... They were all very talented, um, and he was particularly talented as a classicist at school. He won all the prizes going. So he's um, a, a Worcestershire boy. He's not a Shropshire boy. Not at all. The whole Shropshire thing is, is a kind of myth, and um, he was always amused when people went to Shropshire and tried to find the places. I think Willa Cather went there and, and, and was delighted to find all these places in Shropshire, and she threw away her guidebook when she went there. But actually, it was from the guidebook that A. Hausman had quarried his details about <laughs> Shropshire. So, so the Shropshire that will come on to in a few minutes, uh, uh, that is the landscape of a Shropshire lad, is, as Hausman himself said, an imaginative space. It's not a, in any remote way a topographical space. Yes, and it's actually a fairly generic English countryside. It hasn't got the particularity or the his history, say, of, of Hardy's Wessex. And that would be a, a sort of very an interesting comparison, that his Shropshire is much more connected to an England of the mind, a kind of concept of, of Englishness and of a lost and vanishing Englishness. Um, and it's a uh, big the, the Shropshire lad became so important when that Englishness was seen as under threat in the, in the middle of the First World War, when the, the numbers of copies sold of the book rose to 16,000 a year. Mm. It was uh, initially, and um, Hausman paid for it to be published himself. It was kind of vanity press publishing, and it was a sleeper. It sold a couple of hundred copies in its um, first year or so. But by the time of the, of the First World War, it was selling over 10,000 and then peaked at around 16,000 a year. And soldiers would go into battle with a Shropshire lad in their kind of tunic pockets. OK, but so before that happens, uh, he leaves Bromsgrove School and uh, goes to St. John's College in Oxford. He's a very starry, brilliant, prodigious classicist. He gets a brilliant result at, um, at his first public examination in Oxford. And everything looks set to be um, a stellar undergraduate career heading for um, a, a fellowship in an Oxford college, and then it all goes all goes wrong. There are a kind of a couple of aspects of it. It's going wrong. One, I think we sh we should, in terms of his temperament, that he was often seen as quite arrogant at that time, and somebody who was unwilling to compete. And he also, even at this early stage, was completely committed as a classicist to textual scholarship. He wasn't interested in interpretations or literary criticism. He was concerned with going back to the to the Latin texts and amending them so that they were what. Propertius or Ovid or Horace or uh, eventually Manilius, he devoted his life to Manilius, had written. So even at that stage, he was not interested in philosophy. So when he did his philosophy exams and finals, it seems he, he was rather disdainful of the whole project. But more crucially, possibly, he had this crisis brought on by what uh, his falling in love with someone called Moses Jackson. Yes, and can you can you tell us something about Moses Jackson? I mean, there's no there's no absolutely direct kind of reports of what he was like, is there? But but there are some certain sort of hints and tips that come through from contemporaries. Yes, Pollard, who is a, a friend of um, 
of, of Hausmann's called him uh, lively, but not at all witty. Um, and uh, he was also called a perfect Philistine. I suppose the kind of interesting thing about Hausmann's obsession, infatuation with Moses Jackson, which lasted for the whole of his life, was how utterly unsuitable Moses Jackson was in every single way. He was heterosexual. He was not interested in poetry or arts particularly. He was good at rowing. He was quite a sort of jock. Uh, and he was a scientist. He was, uh, I think he and uh, ended up a sort of teacher of science in various schools. So there was no... We, we, we wonder what they talked about. <laughs> uh, but clearly... Uh, for some, the psychic configurations that made Hausmann absolutely devote his life to Jackson and see his life as somehow shaped by his failure to be with Jackson, his rejection by Jackson, was the dominant narrative of his life, certainly as it's told by his poetry. Um, yes, there's a great story, isn't there, of, of um, the old houseman um, being visited by someone in his rooms in Cambridge. And uh, there's still a photograph of Jackson hanging above the fireplace. And, uh, and the visitor says, who is that? And uh, houseman says, that's my friend Jackson, the man who had more influence on my life than anyone else, mm. even though they didn't actually have much time in each other's company for most of their life. Well, they did. They lived together. They had two spells of living together. One was to, to go back to Oxford in his last year at Oxford. He and Jackson. <clears throat> lived together and Hausman who had been on course for the top first in classics and a career as an academic teaching classics at Oxford failed altogether <laughs> it is a kind of extraordinary it wasn't even a second class degree no. was it It was a total fail so clearly he, he, he sort of didn't do his papers and whether it was because of an emotional crisis brought on by some kind of declaration to Jackson or whether he, his father was ill at the time but I, I, it still seems more likely that it was some crisis that was brought on by his relationship with Jackson that made him just not turn up so to speak and fail and given the fact that he was his whole ambition was to be an academic classicist that was a bad move so Jackson was in a sense completely the wrong person for him but in another way of course completely the right person for him in in terms of developing the kind of melancholia which I, I think if you read a Shropshire Lad and Last Poems and then more poems then additional poems those are the three worst titles by the way of books of poems of all time aren't they um he, he was only himself responsible for last poems, and that was very pointed. He didn't want to publish any more. But um, yes, that that Jackson's unavailability meant that um, Hausmann could nurse his wound for the rest of his life, and it could then become the source for uh, the poems that he wrote. And many of those poems are, are fairly direct, and it's about they are a love that dare not speak its name, um, and part of the mixture of of kind of extreme. Um, reticence which they convey but also a, a sense of, of which they are declaring something outrageous and, and almost blasphemous at the time. I could have to remember that, that the Shropshire Lad poems were written at the time of the Oscar Wilde trial when it wasn't uh, when it was particularly uh, problematic um, to nurture the kind of passion that Hausman had for Jackson. Um, should we look at a couple of the, the Jackson-inspired poems? Yes, we should. I mean, I mean perhaps we should say um, bef before we do that that by the time he's writing these, um, Jackson's gone, hasn't he? I mean, Jackson is off the scene. He's 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 leading the life of a of a British imperialist. He's in India, and then he moves on to Canada. He's he's married. He has a family. Um, I, I mean, the, the, the dynamic between them has. Uttered totally. Yes, uh, and, and that in 1885 he went off to Karachi, and Hausman's diary that survives kind of charts the course of his boat uh, as it heads towards um, India, and he is always referring to Jackson. But uh, the year that Jackson left, by no coincidence, obviously was the year in which these poems started to bubble up in Hausman's stomach. He was working at this time. Well, he worked initially at the patent office, didn't he? Um, and he spent 10 years um, working there. Um, and uh, it was while he was living in Highgate and taking walks on Hampstead Heath that these poems, as he put it, would bubble up in him and the stanzas would, would come in an involuntary manner. Uh, and this is... A lot of poems talk about kind of negative capability or the ways in which kind of poetry somehow rises into you. But I think Hausmann is the most extreme example of the passive 
poet. And I guess you could contrast him with, say, W.B. Yeats, who's the most extreme example of the active poet, I will arise and go now, and so on, uh, that uh, Hausman and Yeats in that sense are kind of ant- antitheses to each other. For Hausman, there was no sense of trying to be a poet. This poetry came to him in an involuntary way, as he tells it, uh, he, and there was nothing he could do about it. Mm. Uh, and some, most of the poems he suggests arose unbidden. Occasionally, he would have to kind of write one with the brain rather than, than, than one that emanated from the pit of his stomach. Um, but that took him a long time. So it was spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings, yes. in his case, and deeply repressed feelings. He also says, doesn't he, at one point, that, um, that he, he, he only wrote poetry when he wasn't feeling absolutely in, in top form health-wise. And so some weakening of his constitution was the thing that allowed the poetry to take over. Yes, he attributed a Shropshire lad to a sore throat yes, that that's he right. had uh, uh, in the period of 18... 18- well, let's have a Shropshire lad poem then. Why don't we have number 30? Because that's, uh, that's a lovely poem that, that takes up the Moses Jackson story that you've just been talking about. Yes, I'll read it. Um, Others, I am not the first, have willed more mischief than they durst. If in the breathless night I too shiver now, tis nothing new. More than I, if truth were told, have stood and sweated hot and cold, and through their reins in ice and fire, fear contended with desire. Aguewed once like me were they, but I like them shall win my way, lastly to the bed of mould, where there's neither heat nor cold. But from my grave across my brow plays no wind of healing now, and fire and ice within me fight beneath the suffocating night. Thanks for listening to this extract from Series 1 of Modernish Poets. To listen to the full series and to all our other close reading series, Sign up at lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link below.